Malsberg. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, yesterday at this time in the Steve Malsberg Show, third hour, halfway through the third hour, uh, we spoke to a man who um, was a star lineman at uh, Ball State uh, back in the uh, early 90s and uh, had plans to go on to play in the NFL, and it didn't quite work out. And he talked about how he, he got over his uh, depression and he turned his life around and never looked back and lost tons of weight and has a wonderful family and found found religion and faith to get him through it. And it was just a, a very uplifting story. Now we, we turn our attention today to a, a, a gentleman who spent, um, I guess, uh, 35 years um, healing people, but uh, not just uh, your typical doctor. Um, our next guest, Dr. Ismael, <coughs> Ismael Nuno, he, um, he wanted to be a heart surgeon since he was a kid. And uh, he became a, uh, one of the nation's uh, most uh, prominent heart surgeons. And, you know, sometimes you, you win and sometimes you lose. Sometimes you're successful and hopefully more times than not. But there are those times when you're not. And how do you, how do you deal with that as a surgeon? How do you deal with the, the families and, 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 and live your life after that? It's, it's all interesting. And it's all in this uh, great book called The Spirit of the Heart, Stories of Family, Hope, Loss and Healing by uh, the aforementioned Dr. Ismail Nuno. Hey, doctor, how are you? Steve, thank you very much for having me on your program. And uh, uh, I was just listening to your introduction, as, as, you know, from the inspiring story of the previous gentleman that you spoke about. And there is some similarity with, uh, with what a heart surgeon does. You know, you get up in the morning, you take a shower, and you're going to hopefully go out there and not have a swing and a miss, you know? Yeah. And uh, so... Or, or in the, the case of a, 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 a football player, a fumble. A fumble, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, I lost my daughter at the age of 18, and that made me take a look at my own life uh, also and to uh, take a look at the patients that I had lost and the patients that I had saved, you know, the ones that I pulled out of the out of the jaws of defeat, and uh, you take a look at life very differently, uh, including death. You, um, ha- you actually uh, accept it as a quiet, silent type of uh, respect that you have for those that have died. And what you want to know is that every morning when you get up and you go out and do these surgeries, that there was nobody else in the country that could have done a better job than you did. And uh, if the patient survived, it's great. It's one of the things that you got him through. If the patient did not survive, you know, it was one of those situations where you actually did what you could have done for the patient and it just was not meant to be. So I came up with 41 chapters. Uh, short stories that you can read over a couple of minutes each, and um, and hopefully it'll bring people some understanding of those who are going to face open heart surgery, those that have had it, those that have had a loss of a loved one, and so I want to make it to the take you to the point where you actually are not afraid of it, and not afraid of death. But it's one of those aspects of life that we all have to face. Well, let me let me talk. Let me get. Let me be a little specific. And um, first of all, uh, you know, uh, we're so sorry for the for the loss of uh, of your daughter. I mean, any a- anybody, it's 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 unnatural. We all know uh, the, the correct things to say. But a- a- as a doctor, um, when you lose a child, and, and we should point out that uh, because it's in the book, you you lost uh, your your lovely daughter to uh, anorexia, um, and uh, that's uh, there's. I guess as maybe I should ask the question, does it make it more difficult to accept and deal with, knowing that even though you're not a physician trained in that aspect of, uh, of, of illness, nonetheless, you are a doctor, and this was something that, um, you know, uh, something that uh, she did, and maybe you felt that uh, after the fact or during the fact that you could have tried to stop or couldn't stop or felt bad about not stopping because of your medical training? Did that add to the, uh, the, the, the mourning of it? Absolutely. I, you know, I was trained by my professors to get in, fix it, and get out. And that's the mentality that I had throughout my life. And here comes 
a situation. You know, my daughter, I find her in her own bathroom. She was down. I gave her CPR. I called the paramedics. I tried to resuscitate her. And the hardest decision I've ever had to make in my life was to stop at that moment and say, I can't help her anymore, and you let her go. And uh, it certainly changes your perception of life. What uh, You know, you take a look at somebody who's happy about any incident, and you take it differently, and you say, yeah, I, I am mourning. And because of that, you actually do change how you help other people. So from that moment on, I was able to take my patients, see their death differently. I would bring their families in, have them touch them, tell them that they love them. Uh, it was a very caring uh, type of a mourning, uh, if you will. But it did change me a lot. All right, we're talking to uh, Dr. Ismail uh, Nuno. Um, the author of The Spirit of the Heart. Uh, interesting, you were, uh, you were uh, uh, trained at uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center, uh, Chief uh, Cardiac Surgery and Chief of Staff, uh, elect, uh, President-elect of the uh, uh, Medical Association at uh, Los Angeles County and USC Medical Center, uh, Assistant Professor of Clinical uh, car cardi uh, Cardiothoracic uh, Surgery at uh, the Keck School of Medicine, and you're now living in, in, in Del Rey. So, I mean, you, you know, you, you've been uh, through all the, uh, the wonderful institutions in the highest levels. So, so tell me, first of all, let's start at the beginning for a second before we get to more of, uh, of how you uh, related to your patients and how you dealt with, uh, for lack of a better word, failure in certain situations uh, of, from your surgeries. What made you want to be a heart surgeon at such a young age? <laughs> I mean, I can, you know, I can see you, you said you want to be a football player, a baseball player, uh, even a teacher, a fireman, a, 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 a whatever, policeman. But to, to say, hey, I want to be a heart yeah. surgeon, what, 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 did you have that in your family or what? Yes, my dad was a surgeon and he, he would come home from work put me in his lap and teach me how to tie surgical knots. There you go. <laughs> I knew I knew how to tie those knots before I even knew how to tie my shoelaces. You know, thank God for Velcro, but at that time <laughs> it was in a run. But uh, he taught me that. He told me that in the future to be a surgeon, to be a surgeon that could change uh, the progress of medicine was to be a heart surgeon. So everything I did in my life was to get my ticket punched, you know, my residency in surgery, my training, all my training was just to become a heart surgeon. And once I became a heart surgeon, I, it was full locomotive until I finally stopped. I stopped because of my own health. I'm diabetic. You know, no, I'm Mexican and diabetic. What a big surprise, you know. Is that well? I assume then. I assume that's a fairly uh, high rate uh, Very among high Mexicans. Rate, yeah, yeah, well, yeah that, almost 100 percent of my uh, patients. And what is that? What is that attributable to? Uh, as a sidebar here, a lot of it is genetic. A lot of it is the environmental. You know, the fast food, mm -hmm. uh, the cultural foods that we eat are very high. For example, the um, guacamole that everybody loves. It's it's uh, the avocado is very high in cholesterol and very high in calories, mm -hmm. you know. So you keep on eating gallons of that, and that's what you sure look like. sure. I thought I thought that the uh, avocado had uh, quote unquote good fat like nuts and all, and not 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 much of the it saturated does. It fat. It has oils, but it also has high cholesterol. It does. Okay, good to it, know. It, it'll kill you. <laughs> good, good to know. All right. Uh, so let so let me let me go back to um to, to the more serious uh, things. So, so you, you operate. How many, first of all, what percentage um, is, is is does the average, let's say, heart surgery? And if someone comes in for heart surgery, or throughout your career, or throughout the career of a typical heart surgeon, uh, what what percentage is usually successful? I guess it varies based on severity of cases. And but what is an average heart surgeon? You know, is it is it success nine out of ten times, eight out of ten times? What it? What, yeah, what? you're very close. It's. Uh, it's ninety-seven to ninety-nine. Well, that's pretty. Oh. That's pretty darn good. Okay, so then it's yeah. so when you have to deal on those rare occasions uh, over the course of uh, over thirty years uh, with with death, uh, uh, what? How do you? How do you prepare the family? And do you prepare the family going in? To the surgery because there's that risk. Obviously, it's heart open heart surgery. Right. Um, and and you know and then once it's over, if if the worst happens, what do you what's the what do you do? How do I mean? Is the family usually prepared for the worst? 
Yeah, we we have changed dramatically the um, the course of events in heart surgery uh, over at least during my career, and. Everybody that came in they used to say the cardiologist would send a patient to you and say, if you don't operate on this patient, he's certainly going to die. So give it a shot and see if you can get him through. But because of logistics and, and, and statistics throughout the country and third payers and, you know, the insurances, if you have a bad betting average, they're not going to pay you. They're not going to cover allow it, you to really? see patients. Huh. So because of that, you have to take the better success of the patients that are coming in. So the philosophy of surgery has changed. We no longer take, well, we'll give you a chance. If you have a chance and if we can fix it, we'll operate on you. That's it. That's, that's, that's interesting. All right. So, so doctor, um, what, what advice would you give uh, in closing here to uh, to, uh, I don't know, to people on both sides of it in dealing with death, whether it's uh, someone in the medical profession who loses a patient, and, and, I, and I suppose uh, someone who, and we're all going to go through it, or we all have gone through it, or we all are going through it, who loses a loved one. How, do you, how, should, they, how should both sides of the equation in the doctor-patient relationship, um, you know, in the family and the doctor, look, look at death? Love your loved ones as much as you can. That's all you can do. That's very simple. That's very simple and very profound. Uh, Doctor, good luck with the book. I assume it's available all over the place? Yes, it is. It's available on Amazon.com and Barnes and & Noble, and uh, you can get it in the Kindle and Nook as well. Okay. The book is The Spirit of the Heart, Stories of Family, Hope, Loss, and Healing by Ismail uh, Nuno, Dr. Nuno. Ismail Nuno. Yes. Thank you, sir.